Big Ben sounding, music in the air, and how that music takes me back straight away for 50 years. Today, in December 1982, I'm standing on the steps of All Souls Church, Portland Place, in the very spot where I stood in December 1932, to gaze up at London's latest architectural sensation, the brand new Broadcasting House. Here it stands at the top of Portland Place, still in all its curved splendor. It seems to me unchanged, except that the window boxes on the balconies have gone. I think they put them there in the early days, for Broadcasting House was felt to be daringly modern. How very well, but the public was puzzled. But the inspirer of the building, John Reith, then Director General of the BBC, was delighted. He dedicated his new headquarters as a temple of the arts and music. And its symbol, aerial and prospero. Be still, ye choirs of sorrow and delight that greet mine ears, sans purpose and sans cause. I tell thee, Ariel, these noises are the winnowings of the wind, straws in the air. These will I regulate. I'll gather them beneath one mighty roof that shall become the home and fountainhead of sound. A mansion built for man's enjoy, his entertainment and instruction. By what name, Master, shall this house be called? Broadcasting House. Lo, the foundation stone is laid on earth. Lo, the walls mounting on the storied air. A web of corridors, a tower of stairs. A myriad windows compassing the globe. A high for gods to hum in. Lo, the roof! Broadcasting house is risen! The new home of Wireless. This temple of the arts and muses is dedicated to Almighty God. 1,250,000 blocks of Portland stone. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. Go if you swing in front, down. to the side, across. Studio to hold 1,000 people. no other thrill quite so grand as when old... Heating and ventilation, the most modern in the world. The fastest lifts in London. The new Tower of London. The Tower of Silence. The second Tower of Babel. Yes, Broadcasting House, the new marvel of London. The personification in stone of the very spirit of progress as we, the young, saw it in 1932. But the old guard, the establishment, thought otherwise. They described the building as a profane cathedral, and here's a good one, as a petrified dreadnought. The very name seemed outlandish. To the editor of the Daily Telegraph, Sir, Unless someone is speedily inspired to produce a better label, the new headquarters of the BBC may be handed down to posterity bearing the incredible title Broadcasting House. If only for the sake of euphony, can we not improve on this? Yours, Mill uh, Hill. Certainly, Broadcasting House sounds very bare. It brings to mind thoughts of a sixpenny bazaar. Yours, Lewis. Sir, in the naming of Broadcasting House, why include house at all? This upsets the euphonic balance. Belgravia has always been pleasing to the ear. I would suggest something similar. Melodare, Melodaria, or Melodity. Yours, South Sea. Uh, seeing that the most characteristic activity of the BBC is the persistent murder of our mother tongue, why not call its new home Crippin House? Yours, Hampstead. Well, if the name aroused a storm, it was as nothing to the outrage of Eric Gill's statue of Prospero and Ariel. I'm looking across at it now, and I remember how vile the Duchess of Rutland was appalled at the selection of Eric Gill in the first place, but she consoled herself with the thought that at least he was better than Epstein or Henry Moore. But Gill was an odd choice and a bold one for the job. 
he was an eccentric as well as being a fine artist, a fervent Catholic convert. But that didn't prevent him from being almost obsessed with sex. And he roared with laughter when he heard the criticisms. Prospero, he declared? Well, it's a symbolic piece, rather like the three balls outside a pawnbroker's shop. But he had toned down Ariel, in deference to one of the BBC governors, who remarked that the boy was curiously well endowed. When the statue was unveiled, the MP for St Pancras, Mr Mitchison, who lived just across the road from here in Portland Place, well, he took his indignation to the House of Commons. I would like to put it to the Home Secretary that he should instruct the police to compel the Directorate on the British Broadcasting Corporation to remove immediately the statue recently placed over the front entrance of Broadcasting House in Portland Place on the grounds that it is objectionable to public morals and decency. <laughs> no, sir. Is it the opinion of the right honourable gentleman that there is no offence against public decency in this case? I propose to quote the words of Mr Gladstone, who had to yeah, answer yeah. the question. I am not officially the arbiter either of taste or morals, and I have no control over the decoration of private buildings unless they violate the law. Were it otherwise, I should see no reason for interfering. But is this not a case of on a soir et mal à <laughs> Gill worked away in all weathers on a scaffolding outside Broadcasting House and he looked like a bearded monk. Rumour reported that in a spirit of impish mischief he'd carved a girl's face on Prospero's behind. Here's a little joke against the BBC, he said. Fortunately, this faces the wall. And, he said, it won't be discovered until Broadcasting House is demolished or falls down. Ah, well, <laughs> Sir John sat up there in his office like a captain of a ship, directly over Prospero and Ariel, looking straight down Portland Place, and, as he said, within a biscuit's toss of all soul spire. Broadcasting, he proclaimed, should bring into the greatest possible number of homes the fullest degree of all that is best in every department of human knowledge. It should not be, as he once said to me, an organ of mere entertainment. And the first words you encounter here in the entrance hall as you enter the building? This temple of the arts and muses is dedicated to Almighty God by the first governors of broadcasting in the year 1931, Sir John Reed being Director General. It is their prayer that good seed sown may bring forth a good harvest, that all things hostile to peace or purity may be banished from this house, and that the people, inclining their ear to whatsoever things are beautiful and honest and of good report, may tread the path of wisdom and uprightness. Now, <clears throat> I suppose I have had three main functions since I joined the BBC. The first is to resist attacks on the organization from without. They were considerable, and they're not altogether non-existent today. Another function is to be on the lookout for ways and means of progress in our work. And the third is to ensure, if I can, the health and the happiness of each one of you. And Reith, as Director General, did his very best to keep those words of his speech to his employees. He visited them in their offices. He even knew the names of all the messengers. He kept an eagle eye on everyone who came in through those imposing bronze doors, especially on the comics and on their scripts. And what a remarkable variety of people poured into Broadcasting House in those days. People made famous almost overnight by the new magic of broadcasting. Everybody came here sooner or later, from the Prime Minister to Gracie Fields. They signed their names in the visitor's book. And like an old-style Grand Hotel, there were messengers in blue pageboy suits with Eden collars to show the guests and the artists to the studios or to take them over to that ever-helpful and tactful man at the reception desk. Good evening. Good evening. I have an appointment with Mr. Green. Oh, yes. Thanks so much. Uh, is it a hassle? Yes. Thank you. Studio 3B, please. 3B? Yes, thank you. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Uh, may I leave this letter for Mr. Cullock? Oh, yes, certainly. Would you mind taking to the desk the other side of the hall? 
Oh, Thank by you. the way, uh, which uh, student, uh, children's art studio? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, BB, please, downstairs. Thank you. Studio BB down in the basement. For now, we have moved from the entrance hall to penetrate the inner mysteries of this new Temple of Babel. The large lifts, and in 1932, the BBC boasted that they were the fastest lifts in London, doing a dizzy four miles per hour. They've wafted us down three floors below ground level. Here is housed what is undoubtedly the most modern ventilation system in the world, and it had to be efficient for the whole building had been constructed by the architect Val Mayer on a revolutionary principle. He had faced the problem of designing a studio complex which would be totally insulated from the outside sounds and yet could house the offices and all the other accommodation required from administrators and performers. And he solved the problem ingeniously by making broadcasting house, as it were, a house within a house or a tower within a tower, as the Radio Times took care to explain at great detail. The building has been so divided to keep separate two sections of the BBC, which are distinct from one another and only come into contact through the medium of certain liaison officers, so that the artist in his tower will not be disturbed by the sight of such mundane, though necessary, objects as typewriters, telephones and adding machines while the administrator, emerging from his office, will not run the risk of tripping over a xylophone or encountering a quartet of Negro singers indulging in a last-minute surreptitious rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now we are penetrating the tower and we're going past the old dressing rooms where in the old days, surreptitiously, those singers and the instrumentalists and the comics were all warming up and we come to the first of the studios we're going to visit. It was the old BA, the vaudeville studio. Liz Allen and Kitty Masters. Hello, Kitty. Why, Liz. Here we are together again, and at the BBC, too. And what a grand opportunity to sing a song to old friends. Yes, I agree. There's no other thrill quite so grand As when old friends meet again And I know we're greeting many old friends tonight There's joy in the clasp of a hand Whenever old friends meet again and now we're Les Allen and Kitty Masters. Oh, yes. That vaudeville studio was constructed like a miniature yellow and black theatre complete with a stage and a tiny balcony, just like the gods in a real music hall, to make the comics feel at home. And right next door to the vaudeville studios was Studio BB, Henry Hall's own studio. It's surprisingly small, but that didn't seem to bother Henry Hall and his blue coats. And here in the old days, you might catch the announcers like Stuart Hibbard just popping down to eavesdrop. Hello, everyone. This is Henry Hall speaking, and tonight is my guest night. It is now my very great pleasure to welcome back to my program that supreme artist that we all love so much, ladies and gentlemen, Gracie Field. <laughs> well, Gracie, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you, Henry. We're both getting the same colour now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to sing for me, first of all? Well, I'm going to sing a nice sloppy song. It's called Oh, My Love. <laughs> But as well as eavesdropping announcers, there were other people who listened carefully and critically in the building. These were the journalists. And here, just along the corridor, they had their own special listening hall. I remember that old room. 
It was full of a series of brilliant trick effects, including a seascape, and the designer had used gold and silver foil to create the impression of sunlight. I remember one feature in particular. To make the journalist feel thoroughly at home, in the very centre of the room, there was the largest ashtray in the world. It was mounted on a weighted ball, so that, as the designer said, the most absent-minded pressman could not overturn it. I wonder where it is now. From the smallest studio to the largest in broadcasting house, the Concert Hall. It was built to seat a thousand people, but almost straight away it became too small for the ever-increasing needs of music broadcasting. It can't house a large modern orchestra, but the organ still sounds magnificently. Tonight, we are broadcasting a special religious service from the Concert Hall. The theme of the service is the Holy Bible, and the address will be given by His Grace, the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. The organist is Dr. Thelben Ball, and the soloist, Miss Sibylla Marshall. A great mystery of 1932. Everything was perfect at the new broadcasting house, except for a ghost, that damned cat. No one could ever see it, but everybody could hear it. And for weeks, relays of commissioners hunted that cursed animal through the vast mazes of the new corridors. It was rapidly becoming the BBC's most persistent and popular broadcaster, until at last they tracked it down. The builders had sealed up the poor pussycat in one of the ventilation shafts. <laughs> Now, in 1982, I'm walking up the flight of steps that still leads up to the third floor studios. And as I walk, I'm haunted by an echoing sound. Frankly, it was a sound that in the old days used to drive us all balmy. The teddy bear's picnic. The engineers used to play it every morning, and it seemed to me to go on for hours. But they were using it to line up the studios. Apparently, it had the right range of sounds, and the engineers defended it to the death. Could we have some change, we beg? Beethoven, Brahms, even Cole Porter. Every teddy bear but no, on went this teddy bears, or rather, the engineer's picnic. But it gave one designer a bright idea. And here we are now, about to enter what used to be the special children's hour studio. And the designer suggested that the microphone should be hidden in the cuddly teddy bear. Unfortunately, the idea never came to fruition. And neither did the idea of having patterns on the wall of Humpty Dumpty and Goosey Goosey Gander intertwined with comical monkeys, fluffy ducks and lambs. What's that lamb doing here? Please, Mr. Mayor, sir, I, I'm the plumber's maid. I've decided to learn to be a plumber. My friend Toby is being a plumber too. You see, our little consciences have been worrying us. We thought it was not right for us to be doing nothing. It seems so lazy, lazy bones, so we decided to do some work. A very proper spirit, very praiseworthy. What, what is that smell of burning? <laughs> oh, I expect that's my pail, sir. I just laid it on the floor because it's rather hot to hold. <laughs> my carpet, my carpet. He's, he's burnt a great hole in it. I can see it from here. Oh, sir, I'm dreadfully sorry, but I can't hold it for long because my little arms are very short and I have to hug the pail tight and it scorches my little tum-tummy. Children's Hour with Larry the Lamb, Uncle Mac and those bedtime stories was regarded as one of the most important contributions that broadcasting could make to the realisation of the hope that had inspired John Rees and his early directors of the BBC. And let's try all that with the music, keeping both knees straight. Ready? 
Go, swing in front, to the side, across, to the side. And across, to the side. And swing up, across, and up. And up, across, and stop. Healthy minds in healthy bodies. And if those keep fit classes on the wireless helped listeners to achieve a healthy body, the radio talks were the keep fit classes of the mind. And the finest of talk studios was only used by the best broadcasters. This was the library studio on the third floor. Again, the attention to atmosphere, flowers on the table changed every day, and the chairs were leather upholstered, and all the books around the wall were leather bound, and made. But you didn't dare look too closely. They were all imitation. And the portrait of George Washington over the fake fireplace. Ah, well, I suppose it was put there to remind every speaker of the man who never told a lie. The national program from London. Here is Mr. Desmond McCarthy, who's going to give you his usual literary criticism. We are seldom in the right mood for reading poetry, and a little of it goes a long way. This is London Calling. Here is Harry Graham, who's going to tell you something about his aunt. Of all my aunts, and I have eight, a varied and a choice collection. The two I chiefly venerate and view with most affection. This is London Calling. Now, here is Miss V. Sackville West, who's going to describe to you a journey from Syria to Persia. Miss V. Sackville West. When I first told my friends that I was going to Persia, I discovered that to most of them, Persia was little more than a vague... The BBC romantic. cookery expert is now going to talk on cooking for beginners. Many of you who are experienced cooks have no idea how ignorant quite a lot of us can be. Take the word Blanche, for instance. This is the National Programme from London. The BBC Productions Director is going to talk to you tonight about some forthcoming radio plays. First of all, I must apologise for my voice. Since my last talk, I've had the somewhat alarming experience, common to most broadcast actors, of hearing my own voice on the blathophone. When I heard it on this curious instrument, I was frankly horrified. It struck me as being almost the most unpleasant voice I've ever heard. Well, the Blattner phone, that awesome, cumbersome, early recording machine which looked like a giant wheel, may have convinced Val Gielgud, wrongly I maintain, that he had a, a difficult voice. Oh, For John Reith, the religious studio, Studio 3E, was the heart of the matter, the showplace. He wanted religion, a strong, manly religion, to be at the very centre of broadcasting. So the studio was designed to be the sort of chapel where, as he said, Catholic and Calvinist, Jew and Muslim could feel equally at home. The studio was really rather extraordinary. It had no pulpit, no reading desk, no altar, but it did have the figure of the evangelist and the cross surrounded by glory rays. Now we've raced up in those high-speed lifts to the highest point of Broadcasting House, the roof. This remarkable roof, which the architect designed to look like a half-cut loaf to conform to the old laws about ancient lights. But it's got one great advantage at least. The view from up here is magnificent. And this, in 1932, made it the ideal spot for testing budding commentators. If they could describe this view and make it come alive, they could describe anything. You know, today we rather take the commentator and his technique for granted. But in 1932, you was still a comparatively new phenomenon. Where could you find such people? In fact, it was Lon Siefkin, who later went on to initiate some of the greatest drama productions. He came up with an ingenious method of training commentators. I took likely people round to watch football games played by amateurs and small boys and asked them to describe to me into a microphone what they saw. Many were entirely flummoxed. But one chap looked quietly on for a few moments and then plunged headlong into a cataract of words which never stopped for an instant in a style which later became familiar to millions. He was Captain H.B.T. Wakeham. It was something like this. It was thrilling. I don't know who they are, but there's one little boy with the red hair. Oh, yes, he's going to pass. He's going to pass for a little boy with the red jersey. Oh, fine shot. Now, go on down the line with the little boy with the red hair. They're going to be very, 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 Go on. It's magnificent. Shoot, shoot. It's a goal. So I engaged him. And then it occurred to me that people mightn't be able to follow Wakeham's description in their mind's eye at first. So 
So I asked Radio Times to print a squared plan of the football field uh, to which listeners could refer during the game. And a thing that looked like half a chessboard appeared with numbers in the squares. And when, for the first time, Rugger fans all over the country heard Wakeham's voice whizzing along, they also heard my voice in the background saying, Square four, square two, square one, square seven. And they shook with laughter at the picture I created of players leaping from one end of the field to the other and back like so many fleas. Almost on the centre line. No, Chris will come up. He's going to take it. Five. He's going to drop it in the middle of the goal. There it goes. Slap in the middle of the goal. Seven. Ken's head is there. Going to wear. Eight. Ball comes out of Britain. Britain manoeuvres. Centres. Goes right in. Back to Langford eight. fists out. Comes on to Marshall. Six. Marshall clears. Only for Britain to get it again. On to McMullen. McMullen back to Marshall. Marshall across the field to Busby. Now five. Busby gets his head to it. Bounces on his head. Sound, voices, music, poetry in the air. They are still with us as we walk through Broadcasting House today, the new Tower of Babel. Be not afraid, as Shakespeare might have said, about this new medium, the wireless. Broadcasting House is full of sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Prospero and Aero are still nobly at work in Broadcasting House now in 1982. And as Eleanor and Herbert Fargeon wrote in the Radio Times in their mask of broadcasting. Now the player's mask is played. Now the singer's song is done. Yet old time doth wet his blade, counting scarce his work begun. Hark the clock, tick tock. What's to us a lifetime span is to him an hour delayed. Still the countless sands do run. Still the future's in the sun. Tick, tock, hark, the clock. Tower of Babel was presented by Winford Vaughan Thomas. The readers were Garrard Green, Jill Lidston and James Carey. The producer was Dilly Barlow.